People often claim that the United States of America is a Christian nation. This claim may be true or false depending on what they mean. If they mean that the United States is a Christian nation because most of its citizens consider themselves Christians of one sort or another, this would be true. But it's contingently true. If beliefs happen to change in the coming decades, the United States would no longer be a Christian nation in this sense. A more common meaning is that the United States was founded on certain principles that were ultimately derived from Christianity. This is also true, and it's not something that can change. If the entire population of the United States became atheists tomorrow, it would still be the case that the United States was founded on certain principles that were ultimately derived from Christianity. But there's a deeper sense in which the United States is a Christian nation, a sense in which the United States can only be the United States if it's sustained by Christian teachings and values. This will seem odd to you if you're not a Christian, and perhaps even if you are a Christian, so let me explain. In the Declaration of Independence, the men who would eventually be called the Founding Fathers laid out their reasons for breaking ties with Great Britain. They declared, We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it, and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Throughout the rest of the Declaration, they describe the characteristics of a government that tramples on people's God-given rights, a government that undermines liberty or the pursuit of happiness is a tyranny. The primary goal of the framers of the U.S. Constitution was to prevent the new nation from becoming a tyranny. The point of having three branches of government with a system of checks and balances was to keep any particular group from ever having the power to control the government. The division between federal law and state law was meant to keep the federal government from tyrannizing the states. The purpose of the Bill of Rights was to further protect citizens from being tyrannized by the government and to guarantee their ability to rise up if the government ever did become a tyranny. But the Founding Fathers weren't just concerned about a single person becoming a tyrant. A majority of the population can form a tyranny over a minority of the population. Thus, they regularly warned of the tyranny of the one, the tyranny of the few, and the tyranny of the many. John Adams wrote, The right of a nation to kill a tyrant in cases of necessity can no more be doubted than to hang a robber or kill a flea. But killing one tyrant only makes way for worse, unless the people have sense, spirit, and honesty enough to establish and support a constitution guarded at all points against the tyranny of the one, the few, and the many. James Madison added, The accumulation of all powers, legislative, executive, and judiciary, in the same hands, whether of one, a few, or many, and whether hereditary, self-appointed, or elective, may justly be pronounced the very definition of tyranny. Since most people today think that democracy is the surest defense against tyranny, we may wonder why there was an emphasis on guarding against the tyranny of the many, or even an elected tyranny. This concern about tyranny arising from democracy goes back thousands of years to the time of Plato. In the Republic, Plato, through his character Socrates, argues that in a democracy, since the people themselves make the laws, they'll use the laws to satisfy their desires, and their desires will become increasingly centered around physical pleasures instead of what's really good for themselves or for society. Socrates says, Isn't democracy's insatiable desire for what it defines as the good also what destroys it? Adamantus replies, What do you think it defines as the good? Socrates answers, Freedom. Surely you'd hear a democratic city 
say that this is the finest thing it has, so that as a result it is the only city worth living in for someone who is by nature free. Yes, Adeimantus agrees. You often hear that. Then, continues Socrates, as I was about to say, doesn't the insatiable desire for freedom and the neglect of other things change this constitution and put it in need of a dictatorship? In what way? asks Adeimantus. Socrates responds, I suppose that when a democratic city, a thirst for freedom, happens to get bad cupbearers for its leaders, so that it gets drunk by drinking more than it should of the unmixed wine of freedom, then, unless the rulers are very pliable and provide plenty of that freedom, they are punished by the city and accused of being accursed oligarchs. So, leaders who tell people what's really good for them won't be tolerated. The population will only vote for leaders who promise to give them what they want. The problem is that people have competing desires, and, according to Socrates, this leads to a struggle between classes. Different groups select different leaders as their champions to satisfy their group's desires. But people change their minds so quickly about what they want that the leaders soon realize that the only way to remain in power is to crush all opposition. The leaders of a democracy, whether there's one leader or a few leaders or a majority in power, thus transform into tyrants, and those who aren't tyrants become slaves to the will of the tyrants. As other philosophers have pointed out, once the divisions in society destroy stability, people will submit to the tyrant if only to add some level of stability. As Eric Hoffer said, when freedom destroys order, the yearning for order will destroy freedom. Hoffer echoes Socrates who proclaimed, extreme freedom can't be expected to lead to anything but a change to extreme slavery. If Socrates, or at least Plato's version of him, is right, we may wonder, why have democracies like the United States lasted for centuries without becoming tyrannies? The Founding Fathers agreed with Socrates that the unchecked pursuit of pleasure would inevitably lead to tyranny. This is one version of what they called the tyranny of the many. But they also understood that if there's something within people that helps regulate and moderate their desires, a democracy can thrive. John Adams wrote, We have no government armed with power capable of contending with human passions unbridled by morality and religion. Avarice, ambition, revenge, and licentiousness would break the strongest cords of our Constitution as a whale goes through a net. Our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. The government, according to Adams, simply cannot contend with human passions unbridled by morality and religion. Why? Because our government is a democracy and people with no self-control will vote for leaders who promise to grant them their heart's desires. And this is the path to tyranny. So, the United States can only remain the United States so long as its citizens remain a moral and religious people. The path to tyranny therefore begins when people start showing contempt for morality and religion and throw off the values that are grounded in the life and work of Jesus Christ. In case all of this seems merely theoretical, or in case you're thinking that it's better for society to break ties with religion, I invite you to look around. Don't you see the divisions becoming wider and wider, and groups becoming progressively more hostile to one another? Aren't the different factions putting forward their champions who promise to give them what they want and to crush the opposition? Aren't tyrannies forming all around us? On college campuses? In the media? And even on the streets? As Francis Schaeffer wrote four decades ago, overwhelming pressures are being brought to bear on people who have no absolutes, but only have the impoverished values of personal peace and prosperity. The pressures are progressively preparing modern people to accept a manipulative, authoritarian government. The general anxiety on all sides shows that we can already feel the tyranny coming. Schaeffer continues, 
In such circumstances, it seems that there are only two alternatives in the natural flow of events. First, imposed order, or second, our society once again affirming that base which gave freedom without chaos in the first place, God's revelation in the Bible and His revelation through Jesus Christ. So, why is the United States a Christian nation? It's a Christian nation because the alternative is tyranny. And a tyranny, whether of the one, the few, or the many, just wouldn't be the United States of America.